Uh, just making sure before we get started, did everybody get candles there out on the counter? So grab candles if you didn't already. Okay, good. All right. By the way, Bill has the fire. So pray for him. <clears throat> Shall we open our Bibles tonight to uh, Luke chapter 2? Started in Luke this morning, so we'll finish in Luke tonight. Familiar passage, Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, reading down to verse 20. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone, uh, shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign for you, to you that you will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, that the shepherds said to one another, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. Lord, thank you for your word this evening. And as always, we look forward to how you will speak to us through the sword of the Spirit this word that you breathe into existence for our benefit. Thank you for giving us your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In Micah chapter 5, verse 2, we find this prophecy of the Messiah, but you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you, shall come forth to me, the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. And just as we saw this morning in our passage from Isaiah 7, 14, about the prophecy of the Messiah being born of the Virgin, and then seeing that validated and fulfilled in Luke chapter one. So tonight we see here this passage out of Micah chapter five, verse two, the prophecy of Bethlehem being the birthplace of the Messiah. And what we find here in our story as we come to Luke chapter 2, verse 1, is this passage that says it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. It's interesting, the King James original is the only one that says that all the world should be taxed. But that's exactly what this was about. Uh, it's interesting that as we read this, sometimes our minds can just skip right over it. 
But isn't it the same way today? The, our governments want us to be registered, and why do you think you have your social security number? You know, it's not for social security, it's for tracking. And so by the uh, Roman government, uh, they wanted to tax everyone. And in essence, what this means is two things. One, that they wanted to make sure that if anybody slipped through the cracks that they got registered so that they could collect all of their tax money. The second thing is that they would be free to raise taxes and get more money from people. During this time, of course, Caesar Augustus was in reign. Um, Julius Caesar had died earlier in 44 BC. And so during this time, there was this period known as the Pax Romana. And so during the 200 or so years that Rome ruled the world, uh, maybe it was a little bit longer than that, you know, I think it was about 200 years, uh, Rome had implemented this thing called the Pax Romana, which means the peace of Rome, which meant that everywhere that Rome ruled, there would be peace at all costs, but there would be peace. And the Roman government, the Roman soldiers would be stationed in as many places as possible. And those Roman soldiers would maintain the peace. And so the interesting thing is that at that time, the world was thought to have had peace under the government of Rome. But we know in reality that man's heart was not at peace. Maybe there was peace from civil disturbance. Maybe there was peace from people rising up against Rome to try to usurp or to come back and overthrow Rome. But there couldn't be a grassroots uh, effort to do that. Many were had, but Rome ruled with an iron fist. And so many were looking for, at this time, of course, the coming of the Messiah. And in verse 2, we find that this census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. Luke, as he wrote this, was very specific in giving us these things so that they might be later on verifiable for us. And the cool thing is that God used this to validate his word. He used external history to validate the accuracy of his word. So in verse 3, all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. So they did it. They obeyed Rome. And verse 4, Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David. Now, isn't it interesting in the prophecy from Micah that said the Messiah must come out of uh, Bethlehem, that he took the man who would effectively be uh, Jesus' stepfather, made him be from Bethlehem so that when this tax that would be declared by the ruling government of the time uh, would declare that everyone would go back to their own city. So God took something that was universal and used it for a very specific purpose, didn't he? To make the father of the Messiah go back to Bethlehem to fulfill a hundred-year-old prophecy from Micah. Interestingly, interestingly, the word Bethlehem means house of bread. And it's a wonderful correlation to something Jesus said in his ministry, where he said, in answer to people who said, Lord, give us this bread always, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. So Jesus was born and came out of the house of bread to become the bread of life for all of us. So in verse 5, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child, and so it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. Something we didn't cover this morning was the honor that Joseph had toward his wife once he found out that she was pregnant with child. He could have taken her away <coughs> and divorced her, He could have put her away. In fact, the scriptures tell us that he was contemplating these things and he wanted to do it quietly so as to not dishonor her or to cause an uproar. But remember, that's when the angel appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, don't do that because that which that child that she's pregnant with is not because she was unfaithful to you. In fact, it's because she was faithful. And more importantly, it's because she was faithful to the Lord that God has chosen her to bear the Son of God. And so Joseph 
also in a similar manner to Mary, had that faith to believe what the angel spoke to her as the word of God. And so here they are, and all those, all those months later, nine months later, preparing to deliver the Messiah into the world. So right as they got to where they were supposed to be taxed to the city of Bethlehem, verse 7, she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. You know, today we glorify this. We have all these wonderful, sweet little scenes of a warm stable with a fire built, but that's not the way at all that it was. We are told here there was no room for them in the inn as they got to the place where they were supposed to go. And so presumably they were sort of sent out back. Well, the only room we have left is out in the stable out back where people would keep their animals. Now, a typical manger of that day would actually be hewn out of stone. And most you know, nativity scenes we see today are the babies in a little wooden trough lifted up uh, pretty far off the ground. And of course, a, a stone trough left out in the cold would just act like a sink and suck in all of that cold. And so they are now forced to basically lay their baby in this stone feeding trough that was commonly used by animals. In fact, there likely were animals present in that night. So in that sense, our modern nativity scenes may be remotely accurate. But it says that they took swaddling cloths and those were known as strips of cloth commonly used in that period to wrap a newborn's limbs and body for protection from scratching and all of that. But whether or not they had thought well enough ahead to have all that stuff with them, I don't know. We, we can't verify those kinds of things. But at very least, by our standards today, it was anything but sanitary. And so these are the conditions in which Jesus was born. There was no room at the Holiday Inn. There was no medical care for him. He wasn't able to be washed in the traditional way. He wasn't able to be cared for in the traditional way. In fact, they couldn't wash him. He would have probably frozen to death. They had to, as quickly as possible, get him bound up and wrapped up to keep him warm. So our Lord, our Savior, was born really in some of the, the roughest, harshest, most deplorable conditions of the day. So it's not at all this anglicized view that we have today of Jesus. He was born in a very harsh way. So here we find God becoming man. And when it says way back in Hebrews that he was tempted in all points as we are yet without sin, I doubt he was tempted with sin at that moment. But certainly it points us to the fact that he lived a very ordinary human life. We know, of course, that Jesus was born into the family of a carpenter. And as such, he was born into a blue-collar family, as we would call it today. He learned to work with his hands. And everybody was put to work from the time that they were able to work. Now, in verse 8, there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. So if this were a movie, we would now pan now to another scene, out a few miles into uh, the wilderness, and we would see shepherds out there keeping watch over their flocks. Bethlehem, we know, was about eight miles from Jerusalem. And this is the primary area where the sheep for the temple sacrifices were kept. Isn't that interesting? And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them in verse 9. And the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for be behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. I always find it interesting. You find these scenarios in the word of God, where so often God will be revealing himself to someone, and he appears to the least and to the lost, sometimes in ordinary ways, sometimes in very dramatic ways. But he reveals himself not always to kings and those kinds of people, but to the common people. And this is who our God is. He loves all people, of course. But as we read these stories, we find him revealing himself to the, the lowest and the least and the lost. So the angel goes all the way out into this field and reveals himself to this group of shepherds. Shepherds were often regarded to be 
uh, people you can't trust, people who might steal from you if given the opportunity. And so here is the angel revealing the good news of the birth of the Messiah just a few miles away in Bethlehem. Then the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people, not just a select few. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. The city of David, they all understood, was Bethlehem. This is the town where David was born. And so they knew it quite well. And this will be the sign to you, verse 12. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths lying in a manger. Now how many babies would you think you would find at that time of year out in the night in a manger, in the back of an inn, or wherever they might find him. And so this was a a definite sign the angel gave to them as they would go and look for this baby that they announced had been born that very day. And I find it interesting that a little bit later in 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9, the Apostle Paul said this about Jesus. And I think this is significant in light of everything we've talked about about his birth up to this point. Here's what it says. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, meaning he came from heaven as God himself, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. What a picture. So in verse 13, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. And as if they weren't already a little bit freaked out enough, here in this moment with the appearance of something way more powerful than any choir that we've ever heard, appears a a choir of angels, the heavenly host, we're told, praising God. And no doubt these are probably cherubim and seraphim. These are all sorts of angels whose job it is to protect and honor the worship of God in heaven. And you see this verse, verse 14, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. It's not a platitude. It's not well wishing, oh, peace be with you, be warmed and be filled. It's God's goodwill toward men. It's not the kind of goodwill that the government could provide. It's not the kind of goodwill that the absence of war and uprisings could provide. This is the peace of God. And this is why the Hebrew word shalom means not just peace. It means well-being and health and prosperity and security and soundness and completeness. It has more to do with character than with circumstances. Peace is not about, I don't have any troubles. Peace is about, I have God. I have the security of the Lord in my life. So in verse 15, so it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And we're told there that they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. I love how in these early stories we find this simplicity of faith to immediately obey what God spoke to their hearts. They didn't debate it. We don't have here that they've appointed the committee and said, okay, we'll go. You stay behind and guard the sheep. It it indicates that they said among themselves, let's go see what happened. Let's, Let's see what the angel said. He said over in Bethlehem, well, let's get over there. And so they came with haste, we're told, and they found the babe lying in a manger with with his father and his mother, you see, they they took God at his word. They didn't debate it. And I think these things, as the, the word tells us, these things are written for our instruction. And when we hear God's word too often, we not only think about it, which is a good thing, but we ponder it from the point of view of, do I want to obey it? Or will I obey it when it's a little more convenient for me? It was certainly not convenient for them in the middle of the night with nothing that we know of today by technology. They didn't have little headlamps for camping, right? They didn't have any of that stuff. They just went. Perhaps God provided the light. Perhaps it was a full moon. I don't know. 
But they went. They traveled that eight or so miles over to Bethlehem. Now when they had seen him, verse 17, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. What saying? The earlier saying that they said, uh, for born to you this day in the city of David, a savior who is Christ the Lord. They were telling others exactly what God told them. Jesus was born. Christ, meaning the Messiah. Messiah the Lord has been born today. And so they were making it known to others right away. They were convinced. They had seen it. First, sort of like Mary this morning, they were minding their own business. An angel barges in, gives them some news. They take him at his word. And then the heavenly hosts come and validate the word that he was given. They were convinced. They took immediate action and obeyed. They went, they saw, they were convinced, and then they began to preach and to proclaim that which they were convinced of. You see, this is the way it's supposed to be, isn't it? For the gospel, for the good news. That once we see, once we've tasted and seen, as Psalm 34 says, that we should take action, that we should believe, that we should tell others. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. I imagine she did. Because for her, you see, it was all validation of what the angel spoke to her nine months earlier. And as she's given birth in these terrible circumstances, which I'm sure she wasn't happy about, she wasn't there going, oh, praise God, James wrote, consider it all joy when you encounter trials of various kinds, because it hadn't been written yet. But treasuring these things in her heart was because... She knew God. Remember, God came to her because she was a humble person. All those things we looked at this morning. And so she treasured these things in her heart. She pondered them. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. What an amazing thing. These scoffers, these shepherds, these unworthy people whom nobody else would regard. God chose to entrust the most awesome news in the world too on that night. I don't know how, how you are. I don't know how you think about yourself in terms of worthiness and self-confidence and all of that. But let me encourage you that if you had been a shepherd and you were here with them, you would have been the most blessed person next to, to Joseph and Mary on that night because you were among the first to whom God had chosen to reveal the glory of his son being born God coming to earth as a man. So the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God because of God's word, because of all that they had heard and seen, as it was told them. It was true. They had seen and heard it with their own ears and eyes. And they were convinced and they took action. And this is why I say faith is active and not passive. It's too easy to have a passive faith, a faith that saves but doesn't do anything and doesn't James say that uh, we should be doers of the, of the word and not merely hearers. We see these examples over and over of people who believed and who took action. Sometimes the action is worship. Sometimes the action is telling others. And we see it throughout the gospels as Jesus healed people. They went out and told others, Jesus healed me. Even when Jesus told the person he healed not to tell anyone, they couldn't contain themselves, and they still told others. So we're told in verse 21, I'm just going to read just a little bit more here. When eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. And so they did everything by the book, so to speak. He had been born into a Jewish family. He had fulfilled the prophecy of uh, Micah as well as others, or is it Malachi? Micah, chapter 5. And as Jesus was taken by his parents who were concerned about doing exactly what God said. They took him into the temple and he was circumcised the eighth day as good Jewish boys were supposed to be uh, put through that process. 
Mary was purified according to the law. And then it says here in verse 23, as they presented him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. This offering, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons, was an offering that indicated Joseph and Mary were extremely poor because this was not the offering uh, of the rich person. This was the offering of those as the Lord, as you read the Levitical law, he gave all these provisions regardless of of your uh, economic estate that you, anyone could bring an offering to the Lord, even the poorest of the poor. And so a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons would have been basically all they could have afforded. So as we close our time this evening in thinking about the birth of our Messiah, why would shepherds be the ones that this was revealed to and why would they even care about the birth of a baby? This was so far from them. You see, God chose them and revealed it to them by divine revelation so that they would be examples to us, that whomever God chooses to reveal himself to, that that person is worthy, not because they are worthy, but because he is worthy. The humble, the lowly, the despicable conditions upon which Jesus was born remind us of Paul being able to say these things about Jesus. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross." Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus, excuse me, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus knew even from his birth, even those humble circumstances that he was born into, that this was his path in life, that this is what God had for him. And you see, in this first coming of our Messiah, he humbled himself to the lowest way, just as Jesus said later in his life, recorded for us in John's gospel, no one takes my life from me, I lay it down of my own accord. And in like manner doesn't it follow that he was born according to his own accord, that he would be born to poor parents into the humblest of circumstances. Let's not overreach in our Christmas celebrations. Let's understand that our Lord came to be an example to us, to let us know that our redemption cost him something, not just in his path to the cross, but his path through the entirety of his life. When Jesus said later, as he was ministering to his disciples, uh, foxes have holes, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head, that this would follow him throughout his whole life. This was Jesus. This was our Lord. And this is the way that our Messiah was born. And we know that what, from what's revealed to us in the Gospels, that he lived his life in the holiest and the humblest of ways, and he became an example to us. And one of the things I always see in the birth of Christ is my pride being revealed and the need for me, like we just read out of Philippians 2, to be like our Messiah, to be humble, to be willing to be sacrificed for others, to serve others. Remember, he is the one who said in Luke chapter 19, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Let us become like him, for he is our example in all things. Lord Jesus, thank you for revealing yourself to us through your word, for revealing yourself to us through these humbling circumstances that you were born into. Help us to be reminded, Lord, as you revealed yourself to these shepherds, 
that these things all speak to us, Lord. There's no one who's unworthy for you to come and to reveal yourself to, to the highest and to the humblest, to the wealthiest and to the poorest. You have come to re reveal yourself to all people. And Lord, tonight we are here humbled by the fact that you have revealed yourself to us. Thank you, Jesus, for being willing to be born in these deplorable conditions, but also for humbling yourself to the point of obedient, even death, the death of a cross. And even as you were in the garden that night before you went to the cross and you cried out to your father and you said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup, this cup of wrath, this cup of suffering pass from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but let your will be done. Lord, may we learn to live and to think like that like our Messiah, Jesus. Thank you for revealing us to him this evening. We love you, Lord. And as we sing to you now, may you be blessed. And may we be like that heavenly host who came to sing glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men with whom God is well pleased. Lord, may we be that, a part of that choir of heaven tonight around your throne singing your praise in Jesus' name. Amen.